allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Richard? Okay. Let's see, we have roll call, please. Um, Mr. Gray? Here. Mr. Nader? Here. Mr. Moss? Here. Mr. Johnson? Here. Mr. Ricucci? Here. Mr. Denio? Here. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Thank you. We have a full house for a change, and this is good. EJ is going to report to us from the planning director's perspective. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, EJ Avaldi with the Planning Services Division, and uh, it is nice to have everybody here at a full commission. Uh, just a couple items to update you on. Uh, this week, the Board of Supervisors met up in Tahoe, and uh, they considered the Lundberg uh, variance appeal. They spent almost two hours on that item. Uh, but at the end, uh, there was a, a split vote, 3-2, and uh, they reaffirmed what the Planning Commission approved. Um, and that was, uh, I think that was the upper deck built to a three-foot setback and then the lower deck uh, with a five-foot setback. So after lots of deliberation, uh, the end result is what, sure, what the commission right again, had guys. passed forward. <laughs> uh, let's see, as far as upcoming board meetings, uh, we have the Sheridan Community Plan update uh, and also the event center uh, that you both acted on or both those items you acted on, those will be scheduled for upcoming board meetings. I don't have specific dates yet, uh, but hopefully soon. For planning commission, uh, there will not be an August 14th planning commission, so you can take that off your schedule. And it's anticipated that the next meeting will be on August 28th. So if that works for everybody. Then other than that, for the workshop today, there is a sign-in sheet uh, we have up on the table. So anybody uh, from the public, uh, we would ask that they sign in on the sign sheet as well as uh, you know, give their name uh, and address into the record. And that's all I have for today, unless you guys have any questions. Any questions of EJ? I don't think so. The, the two items that were continued to an open date, uh, uh, we haven't settled on a date yet, and I, but, but I, I don't anticipate it's going to be ready, or either of those will be ready by the end of August. Okay, thank you. So that was, I think, the Faulkner Garage and also the uh, North Star uh, Mountain Master Plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that North Star Mountain Plan is causing a great deal of grief for the Tahoe Plan. It's getting overlapped. For the community the plan update. So, okay, thanks, EJ. You bet. Okay, then with that, we're going to take a minute and offer anyone in the audience that would care to comment on items other than agenda items, uh, address the Planning Commission on issues. You feel free to come forward and, then, and tell us what you'd like to say. Okay, seeing no one come forward right now, we'll move on then. And I, I would say that uh, we're going to go to George Rosasco and have him Tell us about the workshop. Thank you, Commissioner Sevenson. My name is George Rosasco. I'm a supervising planner with the Placer County Planning Department. As you know, this is, we just recently uh, finished up on the community center ordinance. This commission made a recommendation. It's actually called the event center ordinance, excuse me. The event center ordinance, they made a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. That, uh, that um, ordinance is going before the Board of Supervisors on August 26th with your recommendation attached. Um, and as I told you previously in our discussions that we had already had two workshops on the winery ordinance, but it was tabled so we could con uh, continue forward with the community center ordinance. Now that you have worked your way through the community center ordinance, we're coming back to um, complete the winery ordinance update. So, um, Along, since the last time we had a workshop, along with this uh, winery ordinance update, we are also asking um, about a zoning text amendment to our temporary outdoor event um, permit section of the zoning ordinance. Right now, um, people are allowed to apply for two temporary outdoor event permits that can have a duration of three days each. 
So what we're asking to amend that to is, uh, or consideration of that amendment is, instead of two three-day events, that you're allowed to have six days worth of events. So you could have six one-day temporary outdoor events. And the reason that we're talking about that is because when we went through the community center ordinance and um, you know, in discussions with wineries and that sort of thing, a lot of times they don't really want to have more than four or five or six events for one day, for more than a day. So that would be one way to alleviate people thinking that they needed to be an agricultural event center or that they need to do other things to, to have events or get an ARP. They could simply have two, three, four temporary outdoor event permits. It's a very easy, it's a very easy permit to get. Um, it's not expensive. You fill out the paperwork. We look at it. We make a determination of, that you have safe access, that you have enough on-site sewage disposal, that you have parking. We inform the uh, uh, fire department, police departments, that sort of thing. Um, George? Yes. Just a real quick question. A little bit confused now on the yeah. temporary outdoor events. Outdoor events. Yeah. Now, this is embodied in the winery ordinance. It is not part of the winery ordinance. What's not? It is not part of the winery ordinance. It is, it is an adjunct to when we're discussing this. Um, as we've gone through the process of community centers and talked to, we're also, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, we're also going out and talking to the winery owners. We have mm -hmm. a county task force that's been going out and talking to them. One of the things that comes up is that, you know, I really don't want to get an ARP. I really don't want to be an agricultural event center, but I'd like to have like four events and I don't want to have to put in you know, $50,000 worth of improvements to do that. So is there another option? And, and we thought that this might be an avenue that we would like to um, propose to the Planning Commission and to the board to see if it's, in your opinion, appropriate or not. So this is reside in a separate? Uh, it is. It's, it's going to be in the discussion, but it's a sec uh, separate section of the ordinance. Okay. Okay? George, over what period of time of those six that you're kind of proposing, what period of time? A year. That's a year. Okay. It's, it's a year, six a year. Okay, and, and with that, because you said right now it's two up to three days each. Yes. So the amount of six, time. six days, it could be six days in a row, a full week event? I guess it could be, although I have never actually seen in my 25 years a temporary outdoor event for more than really two days on average. I, I guess that could be something, and that's something we need to discuss, if that would be appropriate or not. The intent was to allow someone in an agricultural area who wanted to, like, have a, a fall festival or something, a one-day event, but for six days. So the amount of time is the same. It's just how it's broken up. Mm -hmm. So this could apply to people that have a seasonal crops? Yeah, yeah. it could be. Um, and yeah. Whatever. You could write. A lot of time, people who have seasonal crops in the farm zone, they're already allowed to retail those off-site without any, um, you know, put up like stands and that sort of thing without any um, clearance from the county. Okay. So you were mentioning that uh, notification would be given to the fire department. Mm -hmm. Does the public or the neighbors get notified? For a temporary outdoor event permit? Yes. No, not normally. No. Okay, ready to move on? Yeah, so, uh, the other thing you could do is just say they can't be consecutive if you wanted to break it up. Yeah, Yeah, those are all things. That's why we wanted to bring it forward at this point. So those are all things that we can have an open dialogue with the Planning Commission, with the MACs, the Municipal Area Councils, with the public. Um, so as we move forward, we can come up with something that uh, appears workable to everybody. Okay, sorry for your interruption. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, you guys got me off track. I don't really know where <laughs> So, um, as I alluded to um, earlier, um, what, what brought on the winery ordinance update was the Vintners Association has a task force that was appointed to, to review the ordinance. Um, they asked that we review the ordinance specifically with regard to um, making their tasting room regulations consistent with what the state law says. Right now our ordinance says for the sampling of wine. It's not defined beyond that. Traditionally, a sample of wine has been a one ounce pour to taste. What the actual alcohol beverage control tasting room law says is that 
Um, a tasting room can serve um, by the glass or by the bottle for on-site consumption. It's pretty consistent across the jurisdictions that I looked at that their tasting rooms are consistent with the state law. The other thing that they asked us to look at was they thought that, um, just one sec, that the requirement to get an administrative review permit for um, events was too restrictive. Most wineries can get an administrative review permit to allow six events a year. And that's some of the reason that we've looked at um, possibly changing the temporary outdoor event permit. Um, as we go along, you'll see that I've proposed what I call tasting room gatherings, and we'll discuss that later. Um, just to remind you, at the second workshop, what you directed uh, staff to do was return with some ideas about how to promote agri agricultural tourism, but you also asked it to complement the community event center ordinance, the event center ordinance that we were working on at that time. Um, the other thing that you asked me for, and this is why I have a PowerPoint, is that I return with a side-by-side -side comparison of what we think um, will be in the winery ordinance versus what you just recently um, recommended to the board in the community center ordinance. Uh, keep calling it that, I'm sorry. Event center ordinance that contains agricultural event centers. Um, and before we do that, the one thing that I want to um, discuss just a little bit, because I believe it's going to come up in public comment, is that there is a determination um, right now that says uh, microbreweries or nanobreweries um, can be considered the functional equivalency of wineries and are governed by the winery ordinance. We have one of those in the county right now that is operating under that determination. What we have found since that determination is that wineries and breweries, there are some differences. When we looked at it initially, there were no microbreweries or nanobreweries. Um, they weren't very prevalent in the county. So um, it appeared that they, they would operate exactly the same. And there are a lot of similarities. There are some differences, though. And so what I would tell you is we're dealing with the winery ordinance now. Our intent is when we complete the winery ordinance, um, that we will come back with a separate ordinance that governs breweries, a nano microbrewery ordinance. Um, the third thing I should tell you, the what a fifth or wherever I'm at, is that also along helping me will be a new planner that we just hired, Sherry Conway. Raise your hand, Sherry. Um, she will be helping with the winery ordinance update, so you will see her here as well as myself. So is there any questions before I go on to the comparison? It shouldn't take us very long. There's no new information, really. As I understand it, yeah. we probably don't want to get into the brewery department today at all if we can avoid it then. Is that I mean, it's inevitable that it's going to come up today. However, what I would tell you is that we're aware of the situation. Our intent is that we will come back immediately following the winery ordinance update and start dealing with the brewery specific issues. And I'll be honest with you, there's going to be a lot of similarities between the event center ordinance, the winery ordinance, and a brewery ordinance. There's going to be some of the same basic things across the board, but each one has a few specifics that are different, that are different enough that it probably warrants a separate discussion and a separate ordinance. I don't think the one ounce interpretation will work in the brewery. <laughs> that would be one of the big differences, yes. <laughs> We're finding that one ounce pours in breweries, that doesn't really work out. So that's something that we need to, we need to look at and have an open discussion about, how we're going to regulate tasting at a brewery. OK. Well, I guess I kind of follow up on that. I guess one of the thoughts that went through my mind, and maybe we don't really need to get into it in detail now, but if it comes up today, it might be helpful to, uh, you said there's, there's differences between there are and so uh, at some point in time you know to hear what the distinction points are mm -hmm. between wineries and breweries would be mm -hmm. helpful information but I don't so, think you need to do it right now yeah there are some there are some um, there's a lot of similarities <laughs> but there are some very distinct differences okay and some of them are land use issues that you wouldn't think of like waste discharge issues winery waste discharge is very different than a brewery discharge it needs to be handled completely separately mm -hmm. They need to be handled differently. So maybe getting back to Larry's 
it might come up, but really from a response standpoint, there's really no response that we would give at this time because no. when it's all put together, you're going to have the event center, the wineries, and then the brewery part of whatever full packet mm -hmm. is together. Well, so my guess would be that um, it will come up in the context of access issues. Um, this is uh, the brewery that, that that's available that's open right now is is successful, and there is some friction with regard to access issues. Um, that would be the context in which I think it'll come up with regard to access issues. And with all of these things, I think the access issue is going to be one of the one of the points that is continually talked about. It was one of the most difficult things that you as a commission had to address as part of the uh, event center ordinance. I don't think it will be any less controversial with regard to the winery ordinance or to the brewery ordinance. I think it's the same exact issues with regard to access. Okay. Okay. Carry on. Yes. So what I prepared for you was um, just a quick side-by-side -side, uh, comparison. Shouldn't take us too long. Development operational standards on parking. Um, event centers and wineries, almost exactly the same, except wineries have a little bit more. Um, they have some parking requirements for their tasting room. They have some uh, parking requirements for uh, administration areas. They have parking requirements for their warehousing area. But event, but a, essentially event and tasting room gathering parking would be the same as in an event center. For um, every 2.5 persons, there needs to be one space. So it's very similar. And please stop me if you have any questions. With regard to parcel size, agricultural event centers, and this is what I compared wineries to. I did not throw in commercial event centers or community center because it's, it's not germane to the conversation. Mm -hmm. So for event centers, a small agricultural event center starts at 10. Intermediate agricultural event centers start at 20. Large agricultural event centers start at 40 acres. Wineries start at 4.6 acres and move forward. So there is some difference there. Uh, uh, George, why 4.6? I mean, why is it an oddball or a 0.6, where the other ones are even acre, acres? Um, 4.6 is, is the basic zoning that's been in this county. When you see farm, it's 4.6 acres. Okay, um, and, and the reason that it was 4.6 acres is a lot of smaller zone districts have slightly different numbers, and that was take, to take into account. It's really meant to be five acres, but when you're under five acres, you take a net acreage, okay, of access easements and that sort of thing taken out. So the, uh, the zoning made uh, an allowance for the loss of area based on access so easements. And that's look at that as five acres. Basically, it's supposed to be about five acres, but if you take out the road access, it, it, it goes down to probably around 4.6. Okay. And that's why when you get past 4.6, you see even numbers, 10, 20, 40, 60, 80, because it didn't make for that allowance. With regard to setbacks, um, agricultural event centers, um, any activity uh, associated with events was to be 200 feet back from exterior property lines or as specified by the conditional use permit. Wineries, there are no special setbacks proposed at this time, and there's none in the existing ordinance. Event size, you recall agricultural event centers, small agricultural event centers are 100, intermediate are 200, large agricultural event centers are 400 guests or more. What we are thinking about proposing as part of the um, new winery ordinance, and this is something that you'll weigh in on and we'll go through the process, um, is that allow an unlimited number of tasting room events inside the tasting room and with the associated like decks and patios and that sort of thing. There would be no amplified sound outside of the tasting room. You would be allowed to have 50 people or fewer, but you would never be allowed to exceed um, the maximum occupancy of your tasting room. That would allow vintners the opportunity to have small gatherings of people to promote the sale of their products. You might be able to have winemaker dinners and small events and that sort of thing. So that's one thing that we're, we are proposing to address what the um, vintners have stated is their need to be able to have more people on site with um, events. 
smaller events. Question yes. for you, George. Yeah. Um, where you have the, um, or is, uh, at the, you know, or is specifically, you know, in the, as specified by the conditional use permit for the number of people. Yeah. It, it, there, there's not an ability for that to go over those numbers. That that means you have the discretion to restrict it to less than that. Well, actually, in this one, it means you have the discretion to go above or below, depending on the circumstances. With regard to what was recommended by this commission on on the number of events, let's say, there's no discretion based on your recommendation to go above with a conditional use permit, only to vary below, okay? This one does not have the, the only below. George, if yes. you're talking about 50 guests, that does not include, say, staff that's serving no, or it would not. waiters or any of that kind of cooking? No, it would, be, it would be 50 guests. There would probably be um, a few more people. Most of the wineries that we have gone and visited, most of them don't have cooking facilities. Most of them would rely on either um, bringing in outside caterers or maybe a food truck or something, but most of them, so they're gonna have a few associated um, other people. And really our parking standard, the uh, one space for each 2.5 guests and the tasting room and that sort of thing, parking is, is designed to accommodate those things. Yes. George, on the 50 though, that depends on the size of of the facility too, doesn't it, for fire safety? You know, it, because it's it does. Like a restaurant, you know, you can only have some or 40 guests. What the ordinance would say, in no, in no, um, at no time are you allowed to exceed the occupancy load of your tasting room. Most of the tasting rooms that I've been to so far with the county task force, um, most of them don't have anywhere near the occupancy load of 50. Most of the ones I've been to are between 10 and 20, I th if my memory serves me right. So you wouldn't be able to go beyond that. Okay. 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 Good. Um, number of events. This alludes to what you were saying before. The last recommendation on um, agricultural event centers was 26 events per year or less that could be specified in the conditional use permit. Wineries would be um, unlimited tasting room events, um, six events with approval of administrative review permit, that's still in the ordinance, but there's also the possibility about the temporary outdoor events that wineries could also use, but that would also be available to anyone in the county as well. The agricultural requirement, to remember, um, agricultural event centers are required to have a thousand gross per acre per year or specified by the conditional use permit because you wanted the ability to vary that downward or upward depending on the situation. Um, however, no agricultural event center is required to have more than $40,000 in gross agricultural production a year. Um, we would rely on the agricultural commissioner to make the determination that they are actually meeting the thousand dollars or whatever number it was gross production production a year. The ag requirement for wineries right now is that they have one acres, one acre of grapes, excuse me. Um, however, the agricultural commissioner has asked that we up that number from one acre to, I'm not sure exactly what the number was or the ratio was, um, but the ag commissioner is here, so if we need to ask that question, we can. Yeah, um, I would I would think that you'd have to, if you start out with one acre, you'd have to at least have the capability to plant more as you move right. forward. Right, and that's something that as we move forward, um, we can discuss more um, about what is appropriate with regard to um, acreage of uh, vineyard and that sort of thing. Hours of operation, exactly the same between agricultural event centers and wineries. Noise regulations exactly the same with regard to wineries and event centers. The only other option, the only difference would be, um, I believe as proposed, the tasting room gatherings would not be allowed to have outdoor amplified sound. Um, lighting, exact same between agricultural event centers and wineries. Um, needs to be dark sky compliant, um, as little lighting as possible, shielded downward designed to, to eliminate, eliminate uh, bleed off to existing um, properties. Food regulations, 
agricultural event centers and wineries both can have a commercial kitchen, but it should only be used in uh, conjunction with on-site events, and in no instance for either of these are they to be restaurants. Tasting facilities, event centers have none. Um, and the only change proposed as part of the updated winery ordinance would be to make their tasting room regulations consistent with the state law. Um, portable water, not a big deal. Um, these really f not, are not really zoning ordinance issues. There are some um, language about meeting already existing environmental health codes. Um, event centers, instead of going into any specifics, just say, you're required to meet environmental health codes with regard to the potable water and sewage disposal that you'll need that's appropriate. Um, waste disposal. Event centers, as required by the conditional use permit, again, same kind of thing. There's some discussion about winery production waste, on-site to sewage disposal, solid waste. Most of those things are regulated by state and local, state law and local ordinances. Um, and it's handled through the Environmental Health Division. Um, as a planner, I have very little to do with that other than sort of in the broad framework. And I saved the best for last. Access. As you know, this was, this was um, a major issue um, when we went through the Event Center Ordinance. The standards are about the same, except that Event Centers, the recommendation that you made to the Board of Supervisors was that for an agricultural event center to use a private road or a shared access, that they needed the written notarized agreement from all of the um, property owners on that road who had access to that road. There's no requirement for that in the winery ordinance. Um, that is something that we will need to discuss. The other proposed change, and we'll discuss this as we go along a little bit more, um, the connection of a winery to a private road will probably need to be looked at with regard to putting in some more improvements with regard to aprons and that sort of thing. So if a winery comes out onto a private road and then onto a county road, instead of just looking at the connection from the shared private road onto the county road, we need to look at the connection between the winery and the private road. So those are some regulations that we'll be looking at as we go forward. I think that's it. It looked like oh. you had two shells in that last one. I'm sorry? It may be a misprint, but we, you'll take care of that later. You mean a typo? Are you telling me I have a typo? <laughs> I'm going to skip over that slide now. I'm not going back. <laughs> so um, the next steps, this is a timeline that we um, anticipate uh, going through this ordinance. It's very aggressive. Um, August, September, um, after today, we would like to have a discussion about what um, – what you think are appropriate issues that need to be brought forward with regard to the winery ordinance update. And instead of actually formulating an ordinance, what we would like to do is have this discussion today, have your blessing to go forward to the max, get their thoughts on the direction we're going in, come back here, discuss what the max actually had to say, um, formulate the ordinance, then take it back out to the max for an action item, um, then come back to you, get a recommendation on that ordinance, and be to the Board of Supervisors for action in December of this year. Okay. Um, I, it sounds strange the way I just laid that out, but the reality is, is when we went through the event center ordinance, I went to all the MACs at least twice, and some of them three and four times. So I think this may be more beneficial to everyone, including you, if we go out sooner to the max, hear what they'd like to say, then come back so you can have their thoughts on it when you formulate the ordinance, instead of having, uh, having to do the ordinance, hear their thoughts, and then take action. So it'll give you a chance to incorporate that, give us a chance to go back out to the max for action, so you get a, you get a feel of how the max responded to what you did with regard to their input and that sort of thing. So that's all I have, gentlemen, unless you have anything for me. Any other questions to George before we go public? Seeing none, I guess you must have done a good job, George. Thank you. With that, we're going to go to the public and ask you to, those that choose to address this issue, come to the microphone and introduce yourself. 
And before you do that, please sign in. You'll see a, a sign-in sheet there on the desk. Uh, please sign in so that uh, you will be sent any further correspondence and we know who you are and what you represent. So please queue up and, and would hope that you could keep your comments to less than three minutes if you can for individuals so uh, we can move through this quickly. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Marilyn Jasper speaking on behalf of Sierra Club and Public Interest Coalition. One of our goals is to protect farm and agricultural lands. We support ag operations. We want them to succeed. And when a winery has a qualifying vineyard, processes its Placer County grapes, and sells its wine, bravo. The catch is, in dealing with residential ag zones, the contentious issues today are very similar to what we went through in six years ago when, when the winery ordinance was created, as well as what we've gone through in the last two years with the event center that George mentioned. Just as an aside, for this discussion as it progresses, it might be helpful to know how many wineries over the past six years since the winery ordinance was created have actually obtained their ARP, their administrative re review permit, or their minor use permit, their um, MUP, and are operating under the existing winery ordinance. I've been told it's a small number, but I have not had that confirmed. So possibly, rather than revising and relaxing the existing ordinance, um, Maybe it needs enforcement and adherence instead. Last year's grand jury report on winery ordinance enforcement is evidence that a major problem continues to be code enforcement. And until we deal with that, get that settled, we're going to have these problems. Um, it might be best to not make any revisions, but should the revisions continue, at a minimum, in the res ag zones, we would ask that you include no access via shared private road. That's going to be a problem. And also, the number of events should not be increased. The current promotional event limit is six two-day events. That's 12 total. Um, so to increase that to three-day events and to add unlimited is unacceptable in, in a residential ag zone. And then the temporary outdoor events are in addition to those six two-day events. Um, also, I know this is a tricky thing, the consequences of noncompliance should be clear and vigorously enforced both for deterrence value and for the benefit of the neighbors. And it, we agree with uh, what Save Placer Farmlands submitted in the res ag zones. Zoning clearances, that C, where nobody knows what's going on, um, should be prohibited. It's, it's got to have hearing of some sort or another. And another condition that we hope you would consider is that the winery property owner must reside on the premises. Um, and that they should be, the, 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 the appropriate permitting should be conditional use permit. Thank you. Thank you. Did you sign in for me? Oh, that's good enough then. Okay. Okay, who else would like to come forward, please? Oh, I'm sure you're here for me again. Kicking, kicking and screaming. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Carol Rubin. I live in Newcastle. Um, I'm with Save Placer Farmlands. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of things that I think uh, you, you folks need to consider very seriously about this proposed um, text amendment. Um, the staff has recommended that the state law language be adopted. 
I want to make sure that we all here understand exactly what that state law language is. And, and I'm getting this from page 64 of the handout of the staff report, not making this up. Okay, what it says, section 23, 23.358 says, licensed wine growers may also exercise the following privileges. Number three, sell wine to consumers for consumption on the premises. No longer tasting anymore. This is by glass or bottle, no limits, consumption on the premises. That is a bar. Number four, sell all beers, wines, and brandies regardless of source. No longer Placer County, no longer even USA. To consumers for consumption on the premises in a bona fide eating place which is located on the licensed premises or on premises owned by the licensee that are contiguous to the licensed premises and which are operated by and for the licensee. So if you have a commercial kitchen with your tasting room where you make winemakers dinners, you get to serve all kinds of alcohol now. Okay. Now E, nothing in this section or in section 23 390 is intended to alter, diminish, replace, or eliminate the authority of a county, city, or city and county from exercising land use regulatory authority by law to the extent the authority may restrict but not eliminate, eliminate privileges afforded by these sections. It's up to you to decide whether or not these less restrictive norms will be adopted. I want to make a case for keeping Placer County, keeping bars and restaurants out of Placer County. Um, what this proposed set of regulations will do is it will open up the ability for a winery on a tiny parcel, and by the way, I, wanted, I should have said right up in front, all of these proposed regulations are appropriate for commercial and industrial zoning. We don't have any problem with that at all. It's the agricultural zoning that's the problem. And it's the problem precisely because of what Mr. Rosasco presented in the uh, event center ordinance discussion. Placer County has this very, very fragmented mix of parcels between very small, adjoining very large, and that are often accessed by shared private roads. The reference to as uh, required by the administrative, use, uh, in administrative review permit um, that you saw in some of these slides is kind of disingenuous as far as ag zoning goes because most wineries in ag zoning under this proposal would require a zoning clearance only. This is a, a ministerial approval process that's designed for tiny things like putting a, a pool house on your swimming pool. It's not designed for something that will attract all this traffic to the neighborhood. There are no notifications required to neighbors in the, in the zoning clearance. There are no hearings. You won't even know. Even the zoning administrator, it won't pass by them. This is entirely conducted internally in the planning department, and it has to be fast-tracked by regulation. You go look it up. From the minute that application hits the, the desk, the planning department has to give them an answer within 10 days. That's not long enough to consider the impacts that potentially a shared private road with no setbacks, no required setbacks, has on these neighboring properties. A lot of people buy property out here because they want a quiet rural lifestyle for their children and grandchildren. Do you want them living next door to a bar? Do you want your children and grandchildren living next door to a bar and sharing what used to be your driveway with a bar? I can't think of very many people who will. They're going to get out as fast as they can and then who's going to buy these properties that are adjacent to a bar that is allowed to be open from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. five days a week and 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. 
on weekends. Think very carefully about what you're doing to the demographics of this county if you approve a non-family friendly ordinance like this one. Are you about complete with you? I am almost done. Um, I just want to say cattle ranchers and ag zoning don't get to open steakhouses. So let's have wineries operate tasting rooms that are exactly that. Let's preserve agricultural zoning. That's why we have zoning laws. And thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, George, a quick question. Yes, George. When you were talking about the temporary event issue and, and, and the winery ordinance, my understanding was, was that you weren't looking at the temporary events to be in addition to what was allowed the wineries, but maybe as an instead of for those who didn't want to pursue it on such a full-time basis? That, that's the intent. However, don't misunderstand. Someone could get an administrative review permit and get six, six events, and then they could apply for temporary outdoor event permits. So, but if you were, if, I mean, maybe this is something we need to look at including in the winery ordinance, right. but that, 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 that any temporary events allowed would not be in addition to what that, you're already allowed? This, absolutely. Those are things that we can all look at, and that's why, that's why we're having a workshop to, to discuss those things. Um, if you get your six temporary outdoor event permits, then you're not eligible for the six administrative review permit. You can also discuss... Um, not allowing um, any events through an administrative review permit that wineries can have the tasting room gatherings and only the six temporary outdoor event permits. Um, the intent, so you understand um, from a staff perspective is to look at what wineries should or shouldn't do between that 4.6 and 10 acre parcel size range. And then if, if a winery wants <coughs> to have events and that sort of thing beyond what's in the winery ordinance, they need to have 10 acres and they need to comply with the event center ordinance. Different. That's sort of what, what, what I'm looking at at this point from a staff perspective. You have to come to a different door. Good questions, yeah. Okay, give us your name. Susan Ames and um, I've been here before. I live at the corner of Wise and Gold Hill. Um, one thing I wanted to um, address first was I sit here and listen to what we're talking about as potential for the wineries and, of course, the event centers. It's pretty far along. And think back to when this started, and I've been in it from about the beginning. And it, it's almost like a creeping fungus. We took a little teeny step further, and we pushed something a little bit further. And now, we've, now we're looking at basically, like Carol says, industrial retail uses. Um, it makes me heart sick as, as someone who loves this county, as someone who's lived here for 20 plus years, I hate to see this. And I hope we can curtail some of it before it gets out of hand. My main concern um, is property values. And I had an appraisal corporation of my own in Los Angeles for 17 years. I did everything from uh, horse ranches to multi-million dollar properties in Malibu and Beverly Hills. Um, I did review work for Fannie Mae, for Wells Fargo Bank, for other lenders. And one thing I can tell you is the first thing a lender, a buyer, an insurance agent looks at when they look at your property is conformity of uses. And we have gone from ag residential with tasting rooms for wineries, which was spelled out in the zoning when we bought our properties, um, to now what's basically restaurant row. And I don't care what you call it. Um, Wise Villas is operating a restaurant. You can call it a bistro. You can call their waiters uh, wine educators or whatever he calls them. It's a restaurant. Uh, we have a bar that's operating as a bar. And now we're taking further and further steps to promote this. We're not the bad guys. We're not against wineries. We're not against tasting rooms. I think that's a good idea. I think it's great for the people that are trying to sell their product. I think it's necessary. Um, I think it promotes agritourism. And it's not a, a problem for surrounding property owners. However, if we get to the point, and the 
really disturbing part of the winery ordinance is no setbacks. If we get to the point where they can put an event center basically five feet from a property line and my house is maybe 20 feet up on my property, what's my property worth? I couldn't give it away. Already um, properties contiguous to the brewery have been told they couldn't give their property away. And we're going to see more and more of that. I don't think that's fair to the property owners. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's the intention here. But that's going to be the effect. And that's not just my opinion. That is a fact of property valuation. So I think that's something that needs to be considered. I had other points I wanted to, to mention. But that's so important to me. And I think it's going to be important to a lot of people. Because they're not going to know that that's a problem. Um, last hearing, it was mentioned that, well, you can have a dirt bike track or you can have a shooting range uh, next to you, and nobody complains about that. Well, first of all, that's already in the zoning. If you buy a property and you look at the zoning and it's listed right there, you can't say, I don't want that. If I buy a property next to an airport, I can't start complaining about the plane traffic. But this is not going to be something that people are aware of until it creeps in right next door to them. And then we're going to have problems, including lawsuits. Um, so I think that's something we need to consider. The second thing about that is that you're not going to have 200, 300 people drinking and shooting at a shooting range. You're not going to have two or 300 people drinking and running dirt bikes on a dirt bike track at one time. So it's not a, an excuse for okaying this. I really think we need to step back, take a look at where this is going to progress, and um, do, and George has done a great job, and he's caught between a rock and a hard place. But I think we need to uh, think about what the future is going to be like and maybe do a little more to curtail this. Uh, I appreciate what you guys are doing, the ideas you've come up with, and I know you're only in a position where you can recommend, but um, again, you have a difficult job. But I urge you to please, please take this a little slowly. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to sign in. I did. Thank you. All Who's right. next? Please come forward. Anyone else like to comment? Oh, we got two at once. Um, I'd like to take a minute and just try to refute. First of all, my name's Don DuPont. You probably know me on a first name basis from Rock Hill Winery. Um, I want to refute what the previous appraiser said. I'm a real estate broker and a degree in economics, and I think we have a real problem with the cost of property ownership in terms of agriculture. Uh, when I developed Rock Hill Winery, the neighbors loved me because I raised their property value significantly. I took a piece of property that had junk and was in ruins. Uh, I was a third owner since about 1880. Um, and made the property beautiful and the people love it and actually raised the property value. The impact that I have in terms of events is really small uh, and I think there should be a clear uh, definition between an event center and a wine ordinance issue. So they're really uh, two, different, two different entities. Um, and, I, and in terms of the economics, if you think about Prop 13 and the, and the approximate fees that we pay for property taxes, at a $2.5 billion investment, my taxes are about $25,000. Even if I get an ag uh, event center, which is now limited, I think, to about 26, at least that's what's on the table, if I can make $500 per event, which is not likely, that's $13,000 a year. $13,000 a year doesn't even begin to pay the PG&E, let alone a $25,000 tax bill. So I think you have a real economic problem on your hand trying to figure out what to do. And if I had to try to assess you folks uh, donating your time here so wonderfully that the majority of you are probably retired. Majority of you probably weren't, maybe not you, Jeff, and I was going to ex uh, exclude you, but I, would not, I didn't want to be too specific. And then the majority of you probably weren't self-employed. And once you become self-employed and you're not retired, you have a big effort to get through to try to uh, keep the property. And I think it's part of, of um, Conserving, conserving the property. Our property is essentially, once that investment is made, it's so significant it almost puts it into, the, uh, into a trust. Uh, for example, I forget the name of the trust now, but it's a, 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 a design where the property stays in that form for years to come. 
and I think it's value to the neighborhood. We don't, we're very careful about pesticides. We have um, huge re uh, regulations from the TTB, which is the federal arm of the Tax Trade Bureau. We are uh, regulated by uh, wine growing tax, which probably you don't even have never heard of, but we do pay that. The county even called me to say, how many vines do you have? And I said, why? They said, well, because we're gonna tax you on every vine you have. And how many steel stakes did it take to support the vines? So all that cost us money. And that's part of owning a winery. And if you make it too restrictive, what happens, it becomes a hobby winery or a part-time winery. I think except for maybe one or two, I'm the only winery in the entire county that my job is being a winemaker and a vintner and a, and a vineyard manager. Everybody else has a second job. And until we get away from that, where you can actually make a living on your property, five acres or more or whatever it is, then uh, the wine industry in California is not going to develop, or in this area is not going to develop. By the way, we produce 90% of the wine for the entire country. 90% in California. Millions, billions of dollars in revenue. And we pay taxes on it. And federal taxes and state taxes, and if we create employment, and I think the fear tactics that they throw at you that say we're going to be five feet from a property line is absurd. These properties, except for perhaps where you have certain conditions where you have a shared access road, isn't an impact on the neighbors, especially uh, when we're so regulated by sound ordinance and what we can do. So I hope you consider the economics before you make uh, such a restrictive uh, ordinance that people will automatically do as they please, as they're doing now. These events are running right now. And I know the, the county's uh, complaint oriented or complaint, they react to complaints. And I know that in a recent meeting with Michael Johnson, there were no active complaints. So I think before we over regulate us, I think we should probably set it up where there's some checks and balances. So if there are complaints, then the people that run these facilities get their hands slapped in some way or perhaps lose the ability to have future events. And so that might be a consideration as a compromise because I think you're going to hurt us economically and hurt agriculture economically if, uh, if you get too restrictive. And what's going to happen is people are going to just shrug their shoulders and not do it. I got one more thing to say. Uh, Ed Bonner was in my winery having a glass of wine the other day, or not a couple of months ago. And I said, Ed, I'm just having a hell of a time with the county. I don't think they see the big picture. I said, I'm not supposed to have you in here drinking wine. What can the county do to me? He looked at me and said, nothing. It's a civil matter. I said, you mean the police aren't going to haul me away in handcuffs for having you in here? He says, no. So the problem is the county planning department has no teeth because what's going on now is happening without permission. So I don't want you to make the ordinance so restrictive that people run around and circumvent the, the, the uh the ordinance and do as they darn well please. And that's kind of what we're doing now. So let's avoid that and make it liberal enough for people can actually make a living. One, sure, one by all means. Question. Sure. It, it, it's come up multiple times right. about running a bar and and the at least the appearance I'm getting that you're serving more than just wine. No, you can't. By law, we're, we're regulated. See, the county is the third one on this totem pole in regulations. It's the, the highest regulation is the federal government where we are bonded wineries. We have to have a bond. We, we answer to what they call the Tax Trade Bureau, TTB. So you're fingerprinted. The application is tremendous to get through the process. The second one is the state and the ABC, and they're tough. The third would be the county. In terms of what we can serve, you can only serve wine. You can, at a private event, serve beer only but you can't serve beer like you were a brewery and sell it to the public, where it's wine only with beer if there's a separate event. This is, this is the information I got from the ABC, or the California uh, ABC. Yeah, called your Yeah. Um, so you, but if you served beer even at a tasting dinner, Right, something. a private you dinner. To, you have to have a temporary license. No, you, the with the license we have is as long as it's part of a private event and you're not serving beer like a bar would, you're not, you can do you're it. Not, 
you're serving it, but you're not. Yeah, for example, if it was a, an anniversary price. party or something, you can, you can, and, and they wanted to have beer as part of their beverages. But we certainly can't serve, I mean, I know um, Carol Rubin's terrific and she's actually a good friend, but she's completely on the other side saying, we're going to be serving vodka someday. If you did that, you would lose your license. I mean, how are you going to jeopardize a million dollar, in my case, three million dollar facility over a stupid drink? You can't. You have to be regulated and you have to be really careful about what you do, including sound and being a good neighbor. Okay. I always take a poll after every one of my events and ask the neighbors, did you hear us? And everyone says, I didn't even know you had an event. Most of the buildings are highly insulated because they hold wine. So they're not just out in the open where you're going to have amplified music that ir irritates everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Mike Giles. Um, Mr. DuPont is an eloquent speaker, but I want to set the record straight on some of the information. Um, he says, my neighbors love me. And I think a lot of us accepted that as fact. Uh, his neighbor directly across the street is uh, confined to his home because he's on oxygen. I had to actually go out to try to substantiate whether Mr. DuPont's claims are accurate. I found neighbors who did not approve of his winery. The gentleman right across the street is oxygen bound. And that's why he doesn't come to these hearings, but he does write to the county. He's vehemently objected to the winery and its operations since day one. When one of his complaints was that when people leave his winery, all of their headlights come and sweep his house as they come out and make a right-hand turn. Um, Mr. DuPont seems to be of the mind, and it's, it's not uncommon that if I build it, it should be approved, whether or not I, it was authorized at the get-go. His claim is he spent two and a half million dollars, and now the county should create an ordinance that accommodates his investment. I wish I were like Mr. DuPont and that I didn't have to have a second job. I wish that I had enough money that I could simply operate a winery. I would feel very, very fortunate to be in those conditions. As explained and as clarified, the wineries are violating ordinances now. Now, the rationale we just heard was they're breaking the law, so let's make the winery ordinance more liberal so they aren't violating the law. Does that, I mean, I would love to expand on that, but I, I Words fail me. I appreciate Mr. Rososko's suggestion. Let's do what the Max want. I absolutely believe in that philosophy. Let's not do what the Vintners Association wants. Let's not do what a particular neighbor wants. Let's follow the advice of the Max. How could anyone argue with that? The Max have made their voices clear. They approved the six two-day events a year. They saw that. They've seen the restrictions that have been put in place. And, they, and, and I, would, I would tell you that these, these guidelines are even liberal for what the Max wanted. The Max, we know, don't want carte blanche on private roads. So I believe it is your obligation, and I believe you are serving the public's interest if you listen to the max. And before you loosen any restrictions on this winery ordinance, I would urge you, please, before you loosen anything, hear what the max have to say. Listen to the voice of the people. And then it's hard to go wrong. Thank you. Thank you. If you had a comment, I'm sorry. Okay. okay, next. Good morning. My name is Teresa Cheney. I live in Newcastle. I hope to be quick and just uh, tell you that I very, very much appreciate the, all of the comments that were made here today. Marilyn's, Carol, Carol, 
Carol's and, um, and Susan's and um, Mr. DuPont from the Rock Hill Winery, um, I, you know, I, I think there's an example of someone who's very conscientious and extremely conscious. I wish all folks were as conscientious as he is. I find him to be a very reasonable person, and yet I'm hearing now that there still is objections. And I only point that out because there's, this is the nature of what we're looking at. It, it, it's contentious, it's highly contentious because of that diversified county we have and these uh, anywhere from small to large parcels that's both residential and agricultural and now we're sort of hinging into sort of a more kind of a commercial use. So I guess I'd just like to underscore again the things I heard is that we support agriculture and we recognize the absolute dire need for agribusiness and for agritourism. We understand that. We, you can't separate those. And everything is ultimately all that integrated and connected. And that's why I think this really requires a great amount of thought, which I appreciate. I feel like we're hearing from the community. I feel like we've had excellent um, assistance from the county and you guys. And, and, but I really want some very strong critical thinking. And I guess my bottom line is because of what's at risk, and because Placer County, as with many counties, is, you know, money is always an issue, and we want to look at the money like, like, like Mr. DuPont was saying, I think we also want to, we know we can hit that sweet spot where everybody's pretty happy and feels pretty like it's reasonable and it's the intent of the zoning is being met and the intent of the people that have investments in the property, longstanding or otherwise newcomers, are not, um, uh, you know, a slipped in, a, a raw deal from the back door to where basically we hit that sweet spot and we can please most people. But that it means very, very careful scrutiny at this end. It means for us to be able to manage such a complex issue. It also means excellent monitoring rather than loosening the laws. I think we just need to make sure that we have good things in place to take a look at those requirements like the gross uh, product agricultural product that would qualify you for a agricultural event center. I think we need to monitor. I think we're getting a little cart before the horse if we loosen things and make them more flexible. And when we don't have our code enforcement and our monitoring up to snuff, because I think if those are in place, then that's, that will be the things that will allow the flexibility at the conditional use permit. It should be those things that we have a healthy system that no can afford loosening this a little or allowing a little variance here and there to accommodate somebody who has plans for increasing the agriculture and the agritourism of Placer County. But it shouldn't be done just by loosening the, the guidelines. It should be done by having a very, very healthy, sustainable system, which includes code enforcement, which includes monitoring these things we set aside, and takes away these open-ended, Numbers like, well, you need to have at least 4.6 acres or less or more or up to the conditional use permit person. What kind of a, what kind of a guideline is that? That's, that's you know, it, that, that brings, it, it's not really resolving the problem. I think there's been, flexibility is one thing, but I think there needs to be some teeth in this and some boundaries to this that'll allow you to manage it successfully so that there isn't legal action, so there isn't uh, contention amongst neighbors and, and business owners and, and all these folks living in this diverse area. To manage this so that it can be enjoyed by everybody and with less involvement from the county having to be, you know, being the ones that they're being contending, I think we need to start off a little bit conservatively, a little bit conservatively and certainly with some firm boundaries not with, with this vagueness. It was the vagueness that raised the community center issue and the event center issue in the first place, and it was, it allows for abuse. It allows for abuse, it makes for a harder enforcement problem, it makes, it, 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 until we test this out, like anything as complex as this, I think we ought to be a little bit more baby steps than open-ended the flexibility is appreciated in terms of encouraging the, the agricultural growth, but we want to do that successfully. And there, are, and there are going to be people that need these kind of guidelines and this kind of useful information that Mr. DuPont said just to know what they're getting themselves into. I mean, for their own personal disaster, for the county's disaster, I suggest 
also, as was said, I love the idea that George had spoke about, about let's go to the max before you guys have to give it too much cogitating and before you have to do a lot of second guessing, let's go to the max. Let's hear from the individuals, that's how it was designed, and let's take those recommendations and that back to you guys to be of assistance to you so we can act as agents that help you make decisions and do the critical thinking required. So I really, uh, I urge you to be, to, to hear what these folks have to say. I think they're all, have a common goal in many ways, and that is, to, you know, something more harmonious that can happen that will keep Placer County healthy. So there, there's a lot at risk. Thank you. Next, anyone else? Answer your phone. I thought I had it turned off. Oh, it was that your phone. I was, just, I was just joking with you. I thought, I didn't know it was your phone, <laughs> Larry. It was your phone. <laughs> if you said Sorry. anyone else, somebody was calling you. <laughs> a phone Sorry. a friend? Good morning. Good morning. I'm Josh Hunsinger. I'm the Placer County Agricultural Commissioner. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I'm very kind of behind the scenes involved in this. I work with our, our wineries on a literally a daily basis in my job. And so I, I feel like I... I have a lot of perspective on this issue and just a uh, few things I'll share as opinions and a few just for you to consider as, as uh, kind of the di dynamics as I see them playing out in the county. Um, one of the things I'm charged with is kind of uh, a role in our right to farm ordinance. And um, so when there's a conflict, once, when a, a conflict arises about the right to farm ordinance, when a farmer's doing something and someone, you know, maybe doesn't like it, I get called in to help kind of evaluate that situation and judge, you know, kind of whether the farmers within the bounds of what normal farming practices are, standard farming practices, or whether the complaint is valid and the farmer's doing something kind of out in left field that maybe needs to be curtailed. And what I see in that is that, you know, through that process I've got a lot of experience with looking at the definition of farm zoning and, and specifically I'm, I'm looking more at farm zoning than res ag zoning as in this winery discussion and what I see is that farm zoning supports farming. You know, that's, that's the big purpose, that's why it's called farm zoning. And um, it's, you know, from my perspective farming is something that's an intense commercial use. It can be dirty, it can be smelly, it can be dusty, it involves pesticides, sometimes it involves airplanes flying around, it involves doing things in the middle of the night because that's when they have to be done or that's when the wind has died down or that's when the guy with the second job has time to do it. And so in a lot of those instances, um, farm zoning supports activities which are not really consistent with residential uses. Residences are allowed in farm zoning, but if you read that definition, the best and the preferred use in farm zoning is farming, which is a commercial activity, purpose of commercial activity. We're producing something, in this case a crop, and we're selling it for a profit. That is the purpose of farming, and the farm zoning supports farming as the preferred use within that zoning. Cause, so that's kind of the lens through which I look at this issue. Um, I think the planning staff did an excellent job of pulling out a lot of the, the general plan and talks about where the county's philosophically uh, lies in relationship to the economic viability of agriculture. It's, uh, the, our general plan is extremely supportive of the economic viability of agriculture, which is a commercial activity, which is also somewhat not always well suited to residential neighbors. Um, I, I get that kind of vibe a lot of the time that, you know, people have an idea that farming is a few cows quietly munching over there on dry grass. That's not always the case. There's a lot more that's allowed in farm zoning, just in the sense of farming, which is allowed by right, not even a zoning clearance. Um, a couple comments within kind of the proposed language here. I see um, a little uh, section in, in page 8 about the trying to parse out the purpose of the event um, just from the enforcement perspective I would rather a, any event stuff be based strictly on the size and this is again delving into kind of personal opinion a little bit but working with the wineries on a frequent basis it gets really hard from the enforcement standpoint when you try to say this is a 
agricultural promotional event versus this is a non agricultural promotional event. I mean, I'll give you an example. I attended a Board of Realtors meeting out at a winery in which they were mostly talking about rural real estate type of issues. There was wine served, everybody got, uh, you know, some, some tastes of wine, they got exposed to the winery, they got familiar with it. I don't know what you'd call that. Is that ag promotional or is that a non-ag promotional? It gets really, there's too much gray area. It's just, you know, I think the impact on the neighbors has more to do with the size of the event and the duration of the event, not the purpose of the event. The neighbors, I don't think, are impacted as much by the purpose of the event. Um, so just something to cons consider there. Uh, as as uh, Mr. Rososko mentioned, I, um, I think I submitted something to you about a year ago, just throwing out the idea of maybe uh, tweaking the acreage requirement for grapes. Right now, we we'll require an acre of grapes to either be grown on site or sourced from Wine District 10, which goes, I think, all the way up and down the foothills. It doesn't even have to be in Placer County. That's fairly liberal, so you could have a winery and a farm zone property with the zoning clearance, as was mentioned, and buy all your grapes from El Dorado County. And my charge within the current winery ordinance is to just verify that the grapes were sourced from zone 10, and that's a functional equivalency. Um, keep in mind that an acre of grapes is about a $20,000 investment right now plus, and so I am very cognizant of that fact, very sensitive to that. If I advocate for increasing the acreage of grapes, as advocating for greatly increasing the cost to start a vineyard or a winery, certainly. But at the same time, I think the more agriculture our wineries are the more we can support having wineries in farm zones so uh, you know I think that's something to talk about is the is the acreage requirement either requiring a portion of that to be on site at the winery property or increasing that acreage requirement even yeah I'm sorry I'm going long here say so Josh yes um, well it's one acre now yes and uh, the size of the parcel minimum size of parcel is 4.6 right. acres, and they probably have a residence or a wine tasting room. Mm -hmm. What kind of acreage are you looking at? I, I would throw out, you know, the, the thing I was kind of kicking around in my head was 50% um, was, uh, uh, of the parcel or five acres, whichever is less. So, um, you know, on a 4.6 acre parcel, you'd have to have 2.3 acres of grapes. If you had a 10 acre parcel, you'd have to have five acres of grapes. 20 acre parcel, five acres of grapes. So five would be the absolute maximum that the county would ever require, but you'd at least have to have, you know, 2.3 in order to have a winery under that, of which you could say some portion had to be grown on site, for instance. Just, and this is just strictly for conversation, um, just to think about. Uh, the TOE issue, it doesn't increase the number of days of TOEs. It just allows a lot more flexibility for the industry, which I see as a good thing uh, that they need as well. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? There... Okay, how many more people want to comment? Okay, this will be the last last one then. If no, no, we have somebody else back there. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. We have two more? Okay. Just try to abbreviate it a little bit if we I will. can. We're starting to get a little long-winded here. Sorry. Uh, um, I'll keep it short, I, and I, I don't want to get personal. So. Anyway, um, some of the issues that have come up today are, um, are issues that, that lack clarity, and, and we've addressed some of them already, so I won't go back there. But, I mean, the bars and restaurants, if, if the state of California wanted Which to regulate us. The records that we I'm have. sorry. My name is Stuart Perry. I own a Fawn Ridge Winery here in Auburn. So bars and restaurants, if the state wanted to regulate us as bars and restaurants, they would require that we get a license to operate a bar and restaurant. We're not. We're wine growers. It's a wine grower O2 license. The new stipulation that was passed was red. It does allow the county to uh, restrict but not eliminate the, the serving of wine and, and other beverages per that particular type of regulation. So, And one one piece of clarity, very nitpicky. Brandy is included. Brandy is a derivative of grapes, so uh, grape brandy in the instances of those special events is, like beer is, is accepted. So um, the private road thing keeps coming up. 
I would invite the commissioners to go back and review the opinion of our prior county council who felt that it's not with really in the county's best interest to begin meddling with private roads and regulating what occurs on a private road. The people on my private road don't have a problem. I'm, I'm submitting that it would be um, inappropriate for a, a blanket regulation developed as a part of the ordinance to regulate every particular private road in the county. If individuals on that road have a problem, there are provisions to create a CCNR policy for the residents of that particular road. Um, so uh, I, I, I kind of, I, I understand the concerns, but I would advocate get together with your neighbors and if there is a major concern, form a CCNR, disallow wineries. Um, on that particular private road. Hey, Stuart. Yes. In the event, agricultural event ordinance, at least what the commission agreed to was that, uh, you know, private roads would be okay as long as uh, the event person had acquired the permission of all the people on that road. Right. That's pretty much, so you're objecting to that or? No, I'm objecting to the possibility that for whatever reason, uh, wineries having events on a private road would be disallowed based on a regulatory part of the ordinance disallowing that particular. Well, it could be disallowed if so. one one resident on the road says no. The way the way the, the event, event center? center. That's where the event center ordinance came out at least when it went through the commission here. R right. I disagree with that, but okay. I mean that was what I, I was asking. And and we're not a, the thing about events. Uh, the majority of the wineries are not engaged in having events. They're engaged in selling their wine. And so it becomes semantics when we start discussing what is an event. Uh, the Ag Commissioner made the point. If someone's there even to have a meeting, they're there to have a meeting at a winery because obviously they have an interest in the winery. So that's what drives that type of gathering, not necessarily a, a, an event center function where you're leasing out or otherwise renting your property to be used by a third party. So um, I do appreciate George's work on trying to struggle with what is an event and, and what are the parameters there. So I hope we can come to some agreement around that. So, and you know, the, the stuff about appraisals, when I had my original MUP hearing, the administrator dismissed any talk of, of of, of appraisals of property and being diminished, I would argue, uh, if you look in the paper these days, how many realtors are marketing their property because it's on the Auburn Wine Trail or the Placer County Wine Trail or because there's the potential of a winery or vineyards? This is a multi-million dollar industry in California. I hope that the commission and the county will realize that it's something that should be supported and it's to the benefit of all in the final analysis. So thank you all thank for your you, time. Sir. Okay, we have another one. I'm Jeff Evans with Bear River Winery and Meadow Vista. So I, I just um, wanted to say that um, after going through the event center thing, you know, I've seen um, this commission do kind of broad brush strokes across, you know, this ordinance thing, and I, I see them maybe starting to do, you guys starting to do this again for the wineries. And I really think, you know, when you get testimony from people who live in F or, you know, res ag, you have to kind of think of wineries as also being in other zonings, you know, commercial, industrial, um, they're all over the place uh, and not just, you know, so when you, when you make an ordinance, you don't use a broad brush stroke across all of those zoning um, types. And then, uh, it seems to me like there's some, somewhat of a misuse of TOEs currently. Um, we don't do any events at our winery. You know, we just have, you know, cars coming in on the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, maybe three to five cars a weekend is, is what I'm getting. And, and then we do TOEs for several events. Uh, one of them is the Placer County uh, Farm and Barn Tour. It's a great event. Um, you know, I had to get a TOE last year for that. And I had uh, 10 cars, you know, that day. And several of them were people that were just coming to the winery. They had nothing to do with the the farm and barn tour. Um, great days of summer, you know, we sell six or 800 tickets. We do a TOE. I had 50 cars show up in, in two days last year. That's 25 cars over a six hour period each day. Um, is that really an event? Um, 
you know, it, it just seems like it's maybe a little bit better traffic and, you know, helped me financially. But, uh, you know, it wasn't really an event. It wasn't, you know, like I had uh, 50 people all coming at one time or 100 people all coming at one time. They, these people were spread out, you know, 50 cars over 12 hours over two days. Does that really need a TOE? The county says yes right now. Same thing with Placer County Farm and Bar Tour. You need, you need a TOE for this. Um, the comment about being a bar, you know, it's already been said, we're wine growers. We have an O2 license. I can serve wine. Um, that, that's what it's about. It's growing wine. It's not, uh, you know, serving uh, hard, you know, martinis or things like that. And it's just, I don't know where that is coming from, really. And what really pains me is that most of the wine lovers um, aren't here. They have jobs, you know. <laughs> they don't come. Uh, to events like this, um, you know, what you have here is you have a very small group of, you know, angry people that are really, frankly, clustered in the F zone, you know, down on Wise Road and, and not in Meadow Vista where I am or, you know, uh, where most of the other wineries are. And, and those people, the people that love to come and taste wine and buy our wine, you know, they don't come to planning commission hearings to try to help protect us. I wish they would, but they just don't. And what I, what I don't see here today is where are all the angry neighbors? You know, like uh, Stewart, you know, he mentioned he's on a private road. Where's all the angry neighbors against Stewart? Uh, same thing with Charlie Green. He's on a private road. You know, where's all the angry neighbors that, you know, don't want, you know, him to continue as a winery? Uh, I think, uh, you know, Pescator is in the same situation. You know, they're on a, a very small private road. You know, where are all the angry neighbors? They're not here. You have, you know, the Safe Plaster Farm Lands and, and, you know, Sierra Club, you know, speaking. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh -oh. Well, here's looks the like, angry neighbor. Looks like, we, looks like we motivated somebody here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lori Boom. I live at 550 Wise Road. And I, we've been there almost 20 years. I've been in Lincoln all my, well, not all my life, since the mid-70s. And, and I love the growth. Don't get me wrong. I love the growth. I mean, I love going to Target. Oh, did somebody leave their phone? Oh, is this, is this a phone? Oh, okay. Don't steal it. I'm from, huh? <laughs> I'm from stinking Lincoln, sorry. I'm still that old original style. But anyhow, uh, I just want to say the reason why I'm angry is because we were there prior to the brewery that opened up at the end of the shared road. We both live on the shared road and at the very end of the shared road is where it splits off and you go one direction, gosh, maybe 15 feet, you know, to the brewery and then you go straight into our gate. And um, we own 25% of the road, and the neighbor in front of us, not the brewery, owns the other 75%. Um, I, and I'm sorry, I'm going to try to make this short. I never public speak. Uh, at any rate, I'm angry because we have to now put up with, with the traffic. It's four days a week, and the worst traffic is on Saturday and Sunday. And I used to be able to take my grandkids, especially my granddaughter, and take her, take, take her down on the pony to be able to give her, I kind of made her feel like she was trail riding because it's a gravel road. You know, take her off the property and we're going to go trail riding. Well, I can't do that. There's so many hostile customers now they, um, that when they leave especially from the brewery and, and drinking, they've been drinking quite a bit, um, it's not safe. It's not safe. It's gravel. So now I can't even, and my granddaughter likes to go down and look at the NID ditch where there's a waterfall. We can't do that anymore. It's, it, it's our, our country lifestyle that we moved here 20 years ago on that particular property um, is gone. And uh, we found out through our attorney that on the application for the brewery, there's a section called notification. The notification, I feel, should be to where it's proven notification. Somehow the brewery got our name, put it down before they even were living here. They weren't even in the Lincoln area. Uh, prior to buy, buy, buying the property, we talked to the previous 
uh, property owners that we still go out to dinner with, and 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 they didn't even they didn't even buy the property yet, but they were just trying to see if they can open the brewery. But they put, got our information, put it down, and said that they had our blessing and welcomed them to the area. We didn't even know them. But anyhow, so so I didn't move next door to this, like moving next door, um, like Carol said, to an airport. If I move next door to an airport, that's my problem. I chose to do that. But this came to me. Um, so the shared road is definitely such an important issue. It's um, my husband um, caught one of the customers. It was about maybe six and a half weeks ago. He had to tell the man to zip up his pants because he was urinating as he left the as he left the brewery. He was on our part of the owning of the shared road, and my horses, my two horses, were right there. And they weren't right next to the fence, but they were really close, and the man stopped and urinated. And I was out on my dock, and my husband was at the irrigation line checking for the drips. But, so see, this, but it's just, it's just not right. We need to be notified, but there needs to be proof of notification, not, not just, oh, I can fill this out on the application and, and you know, It'll be okay. So I, I've got so many more, but I don't want to take any more time. And I hate to sound like a upset neighbor, but I am. I, my, my country life has just went. And oh, one more thing. Um, back to the appraisal. We had two. I'm not very good at this, am I? This mic. Um, back to the appraisal. We had two different appraisers out, nobody we knew. Um, and our property value, there, there were both of them at different times said, good luck. Good luck trying to sell. You know, and it has lowered our property value because we've checked on it. We're, we're trying to actually maybe um, buy some property and start growing walnuts. And, um, but we, we're, we've got to try to sell our place and it doesn't look good. So, okay. anyhow, thank you. thank you very much. Hey, anyone else? Hey, I guess we'll make this our last yeah, one, the finale. I just, I'm Kurt Miller, and I have a man and, and, uh, and Penryn. You know, I, I want to apologize first to the young lady that I got up first because we were both at a MAC meeting, and I sort of, came unglued at the MAC meeting as to her side of the story. So I hope I don't do it today. But the reason I'm up here is the gentleman that mentioned the MAC has voted for this, this winery thing. Our MAC, I don't know about any other MACs, is not made up of farmers or businessmen. We don't have anybody on the MAC that is basically a chamber of commerce or agricultural. They're all local people that are concerned as to how they really want that neighborhood developed. And it's different than what the farmers have to have because we've got to expand. Real life, I'm trying to get my property in session for my kids, and we're just having, we've gone to attorneys, CPAs, and this type of thing. And fortunately, I've been able, I had, I lost everything in about 85, and since then, after selling the house and trying to give the property away, I was forced to keep the property. And since then, because of Placer County, the property has increased considerably in value. So we're going to we're okay, but are trying to get my children to take over. My children are 62 years old to start farming for the first time. Dad told them they can't give up their professional job if they want to come back and live on the property. They can live on the property as long as they do manual work to make sure it's passed on to the family. So I hear all these farm families talking about expanding. Part of the wineries and part of the event center gives us a chance to get into a better revenue source. My revenue source right now is to sell the property off in eight parcels. You can either put nice homes on that or you can eight and a half or 2.3 acre parcels. You can have your boat in your mobile home and all that stuff, I call it sort of a neighborhood junkyard instead of this type of thing. So there's both ways. The other thing that's happened, I've been around here long enough that 
placer supervisors and commissioners have done an excellent job of sorting out the immediate problems around each individual project. I live in Sun City now. I moved in there in 90. You wouldn't believe the amount of people that were against the casino. Just absolutely, and the supervisors did a good job because now we got a place to go over and eat free, gamble. We're probably the biggest provider of clients to the casino per person wise. And then the amphitheater went in. Oh, you know, it's going to bring all the young people in and all the crime and everything. We don't even know it's out there anymore. So somebody made the right decisions along the way. I hope it's making the county some money. Now the biggest thing is we're widening Blue Oaks. Oh, that's going to bring all kind of traffic. Well, they don't realize that if we don't have Blue Oaks widened, we're going to have traffic jam. So you guys and the supervisors have been excellent of looking at each side of the story and realizing that the basically complaints, the negative side of each project is coming from the immediate people in close proximity to all the projects. And once they go in, everybody settles down. We learn to live with it. All these people that are complaining, they moved into an agricultural area. So, you know, I started out with plums and I lost my shirt. I run 80 cows on, on 20 acres and the neighbors, they loved it because they didn't have to, to mow the lawn anymore. And I had to get out of that. Now I have a high density planting. I have 3,000 trees on six acres. I run over 150 head of small of goats and stuff. Harvest time, I probably have 160 kids on the ground for attraction to the, the customers and stuff. So, if we're, you know, but our next move is to do something commercially or homes or this type of thing. And the only reason we're not doing that is I'm not willing to sell it now. I want my kids to sell it in order to keep it. You know, I don't have any plans to make a winery or events things, but I have a $60,000 barn to process in. I use it three months out of the year. You don't think I don't think about what I can do with it the other nine months out of the year? Luckily, I'm not a welder or something like that because I'd probably be trying to pull a, a permit to sweat for a welding job and stuff like that. But anyway, I think you guys have done a good job over the time. I've been here long enough that I can see what can happen. I can see the negative, and it's mostly the local people that are concerned that has moved out into an agricultural position not knowing what's ahead of the future. And we need some way to make these properties more productive and better revenue return different from just growing the product. We're, you know, people say, Kurt, how'd you do last year for the frost and everything? They say, well, I'll let you know how, to, how it is. It's a more meaningful. They said, just happened to be the year I worked for nothing. So it doesn't mean I'm going to lose a property or anything like that. But I don't think the local people that move in from metropolitan LA and get a couple of horses or something like that really realize how much effort we kept it looking nice so they'd be comfortable moving in. Now they won't, don't want to basically expand, us to expand, so we can bring more revenue and stuff into the other side, side issue. I have a heavy school uh, customer. My mandarins probably go to over 100,000 students during harvest time. And, you know, as far as the bars and stuff, I got to deal with my spouse. My spouse would never allow me to put a bar on the property, so. <laughs> You got some support there. So anyway, I just want to okay. emphasize the fact that the max are not made up of people that support agriculture. So there's two max in the county right now that has so little attendance and so few commissioners that they're joining the two max in order to get enough interest to keep the max going. Thank you for okay. your time. Okay, I guess that's the last person. So, got one more. oh, we have one more. I'm sorry. be short. <clears throat> so I'm uh, Kathy Johnson. I'm the brewery. Um, and I, uh, I could never s even attempt to um, take the time to deflect all of the inaccuracies that have been stated about us. It would be an entire life consuming process. Um, I invite anyone to come out and see our facility. We are not a bar. We are not a restaurant. We, there's no urination. There, it's 
it is just it's just factually incorrect um, and um, we, we have records of, of everything so there's just a slew of misinformation so just please take things with a grain of salt um, also just a comment on the shared private roads I know that's a big contentious issue um, I think there should be some uh, road maintenance agreements and up upholding of the wear and tear of that. I think it also should be uh, fairly equally applied, um, not just if it's a winery, but any business that it uses the road, whether it's trucking or logging or any other types of businesses that share a road, that there should be equal um, monitoring then if, if you're going to apply um, any signatures like for the event center where you would need, you know, kind of a, a um, you know, consent of, of everyone. Um, I think that that would be something that if you guys wanted to get into, that that would be, need to be equally applied across all businesses that are run from any um, farm zoned property. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now we'll try again to unwind this a little bit. And George, uh, you promised us that this was going to go to the max, and I guess we'll have a period of time while you do that, and then you're thinking of bringing it back at some future time. Do you want to give us a rough idea of what you have in mind? Yeah. So we would like to um, have your blessing to go out to the max to discuss the issues with regard to tasting and um, events and um, tasting events access. Those are the three major issues that I think will be the, the biggest topics at the max. We'll discuss everything else, but I believe um, it's to everyone's benefit for us to go solicit those comments from the max, bring them back to you um, so you can use those comments when you look at the formulation of an actual draft ordinance. Once that draft ordinance is, is put together and you are satisfied with it, then we would take that back to the max as an action item. Um, then once we have all those action items, all, all the MACs have taken action on it, we'll come back and you will um, decide what your recommendation is to the Board of Supervisors with regard to the ordinance, change the ordinance as you like, and then we go to the Board of Supervisors. We'd like to do that according to that timeline. It's an aggressive timeline. Um, we think we can meet it. We'd like to be uh, to the um, MAX August and September. We'd like to come back to you in late September with what they said. Um, we would like to also at that time get a sense of the draft ordinance, um, actually do the draft ordinance, I should say, back to the uh, max in October, November, back to you in late November, to the board in December. Okay, that sounds fine. Any comments on that? Well, Ken? I, I was going to say, is there anything that you need from us that's maybe not clear right now to take to the max I mean any ideas was there is there anything that you would specifically like like me to talk to at the max I'm gonna go over the things that I went over with you specifically I think the topics based on my first-hand knowledge from event centers will be tasting room regulations um, access issues and number of events okay. and and with events um, what goes along with that is also noise and that sort of thing. So I think those are the three major topics. Is there anything else specifically you'd like me to hit on? Well, the enforcement part, enforcement. Well, yeah. enforcement. that works into it. I think you covered most of them. Wayne so, was next. Wayne, you had a comment? Yeah, uh, George, maybe you sort of answered it already. Uh, the presentation you gave us will be very similar to what you give to the max. As I will. You will have an, uh, the side-by-side -side comparison mm -hmm. because it'll be very interesting to see how the max respond to the access issue because, as you remember, through the event process, you, the feedback you got from the majority of the max was that they did not want uh, these event centers to have access onto private roads. And we came up through Kim, a compromise that said that if they got, obviously on event centers, if they got everybody to sign off on it, they could have them on a private road. I'll be interested in finding out if that neutralizes the max concerns about access to private roads, because that is, the, I think, one of the hot topics. And then obviously, as we talked about code enforcement, which you brought up through the event center, some things that you're thinking about proposing to address that issue. And I'm not, are you going to talk about, I mean, we've sort of said that you needed to talk about that. Are you going to talk about what you're proposing? Yeah. Code enforcement? I, 
But, well, actually, let me, I was going to give you a quick update since enforcement came up just a minute ago. We are in the process of hiring a third officer right now. Um, it should be advertised very soon. We're going to pick up a third officer. Um, that will give us three officers, which will give us the flexibility to have code enforcement on call during off hours and the weekends. We assume that it will mostly be during the weekends that they're needed. Um, and so that's where we're going to start. We're going to have code enforcement available on the weekends on an on-call basis. So if there are issues with these things, we can react to those. Um, so that's where we're at right now. And the, the uh, we had suggested that that uh, we're in front of event setters, that that phone number, that 24-hour mm -hmm. access to a code enforcement be posted on those signs outside. Mm -hmm. That'd be something that we might want to integrate into the winery ordinances yeah uh, absolutely that's something we can discuss as we go along right now there's a requirement in the event center ordinance that there's a number that you can reach the event center at if there's an event going on and that um, we also discussed about putting code enforcement's number on there which I think right. is a good I, idea as I well I think it should be as a backup okay okay Larry. Uh, uh, okay I'll make a comment uh, um, I, I think George has covered most of the things, but before the Ag Commissioner uh, spoke today, I'd written down here on this business with the amount of acreage should be covered with grapes, and I put half of the acreage, and I guess part of it he did cover that up to five acres. But I just want to relate uh, a recent experience. I just drove over from uh, Murphy's this morning where I was attending a meeting with my wife, who's a city council member in Roseville. By the way, Blue Oaks is not in the county, it's in the city of Roseland. We did have a lot of comments while it was being constructed because of nighttime noise and stuff, which is understandable. But I was talking to somebody up in the Murphy's area. Um, they said years ago, and I don't know how many years ago, there was only one winery up in Murphy's, and now I think they said there was 12 or 13 in the Murphy's area. But what I noticed is a ton of grape vines up there. I mean, all over the place, not every parcel has vines, and I don't know where the wineries are. I know where Ironstone is, and that's the, that's the big one up there, but there's a lot of little tasting rooms on Main Street, so I don't know where the winery is or where they get their grapes or anything. But I guess I just want to mention, if um, this is supposed to be protecting agriculture, and if it's protecting agriculture, we better have some agriculture involved. And so if you're going to have a winery, specifically that one product, wine, you better have some grapes vines someplace so I really think that uh, that has to be a key element of it what where the ratio is and how many you have, uh, vines you have to plant or how they're taxed like the one person said I I don't know right now but I do think you have to have a, a certain portion of the property if you're going to have a winery in 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 gra growing grapes and it and, and I just want to mention that because I, I driving just up up to Murphy's and walking around a little bit you know the grapes were just beautiful this time of year, you know, the vines and stuff. And I'm, I don't know if those wineries or those grape growers are causing any problems for any of the neighbors. I, that part I couldn't, couldn't answer. Maybe it's some place we could go to find some information in the meantime, but uh, just want to relate that experience to you today. So thank you. So you must have been having some problems because you went there. No, that's no, a, no. That's a problem to start with. No, well, oh. <laughs> you mean I was a problem. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> hey, where, where? Richard. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. He was next. Oh, I back. just wanted to maybe continue on uh, maybe uh, with uh, what was just said. Uh, the other Richard just said, basically, uh, and I heard Josh's proposal or the Ag Commissioner's proposal on uh, the acreage of grapes. And in the presentation, uh, it was still pretty open. And it seems like uh, that proposal should be actually in the presentation, what we're actually talking about. At least what I heard is 50% uh, of the property up to uh, five acres for the larger properties. And so the specifics of that should be in the proposal to see what people think about it. Okay. And then, then, then my comment on, on that line, too, is what the Ag Commissioner brought up was that as long as the grapes are from District 10, but not necessarily Placer County. So somebody could go out and say, I have a winery on... 4.6 acres and not have one grape in the county. I wonder if just, I guess, for my interest on this, what the commission thinks about that. Well, I can. I thought, let me answer that question. Um, I think if you have a winery, I think you should plant some grapes. If we're trying to provide, the, right at the top of the ordinance, 
we're saying we're trying to hold on to or increase uh, agricultural production in Placer County. I'm not against buying grapes because I think all the wineries buy them from all over the place blend, yeah. and they, they blend them or whatever they have. But I think you need at least a certain amount of grapes on the property if you want to start a, wine or, uh, a winery. If you don't want to have a winery, then don't plant any grapes, I guess, you know. But if you want a winery, the privilege of owning a winery on, on, in Placer County, I guess it's a privilege. You have to go through a lot of hoops. But I think you have to have some wine or some grapes planted on the property. And so even on a 4.6, I don't know if half, like a 2.3, that might be an overburden. But, uh, but anyway, I think you need some grapes there, and even if you purchase a lot of them from, from Zone 10 or even from someplace else. But I think you need to have some kind of production there if we're trying to increase uh, agriculture in the county. Wayne, we haven't heard from you yet. Hmm. Any comments? Um, I think that if allowing a winery on a piece of property is what keeps it undeveloped and unsubdivided and somewhat agricultural, then the ordinance has accomplished its purpose, whether or not the grapes are grown on site or somewhere else in Placer County. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that it's going to be real easy to control where the grapes are grown and where they go because I know I visited a large growing operation just recently, not far from where you were talking about, and I walked the the rows and every row of grapes has the kind of grape and who owns those grapes. And it not necessarily was the parent company. They were, every row was owned by, or the, the grapes coming off of it were owned by, uh, had already been bought before the season started way ahead of time. And so it's, it's, a, it's a bookkeeping uh, challenge, I would think, to keep track of. <coughs> but they had every row labeled who, what kind of grape it was and who owned those grapes this, this season. And, uh, and they, these rows were a quarter of a mile long, every one of them, you know, it was just amazing. And they obviously, they, I don't know whether who picks them and who ships them, but they, they're grown on some pretty interesting hillsides. Mm -hmm. At any rate, hey, I wanted to, yeah, I guess, you know, this issue came up when we looked at the winery ordinance before. At that time, I had uh, checked in El Dorado and Amador County and all the counties have a requirement for uh, a certain portion of the property to have grapes on them. I think their intent there is to uh, prevent somebody from coming in and just putting in a winery without really being in agricultural production. And so, uh, at any rate, you know, I support, in fact, I thought we did uh, in that previous ordinance. I know it might have changed, but I thought the idea was that one acre of grapes was a requirement. And uh, you know they could they could buy grapes from other places in Zone 10, but they needed to have one acre of grape. So I know at that time I thought maybe one acre was a little bit on the slim side. And so the proposal I'm hearing today, half the acreage, if so, it'd be 2.3 acres, or uh, uh, you know no more than five acres would be required. Uh, seems pretty reasonable at least to go forward with at this point in time. And it sounds like there's room for discussion on it in the future. Okay, well, thanks everyone for your participa participation. <laughs> uh, as you can see, we're going to we're going to hear this two more times at this level, at some point, and so uh, we encourage you to come back and uh, join us. If that was, if there's nothing else to be brought before the planning commission, we're adjourned at this time. No, I was just going to tell you, I, I have all your questions. I'll make sure that they go out to the max. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.